He explained in the keynote speech in 1981 that the decision to respond to ethnic diversity with multicultural policies was based on both realism and idealism, which was a little bit of a catchphrase in those days. He believed that the attempt to enforce conformity is demonstrably costly both for the individual and for the society. He believed that it denied people their identity and their self-esteem and that at risk alienation and social division. Explaining the meaning of multiculturalism, Malcolm Fraser said, multiculturalism is, is, is concerned with far more than the passive toleration of diversity. It sees diversity as a quality to be actively embraced, a source of social worth and dynamism. It encourages all groups to be open and to interact so that all Australians may learn and benefit from each other's heritages. Multiculturalism is about diversity, not division. It is about interaction, not isolation. It is about cultural and ethnic differences set within a framework of shared fundamental values which enables them to exist on a complementary rather than a comp competitive basis. It involves respect for the law and for our democratic institutions and processes. Insisting on a core area of common values is no threat to multiculturalism, but it's guaranteed. It provides the minimal conditions on which the well-being of all is secured. Now, the last part of that passage from Malcolm I think is particularly important because it authoritatively and from the beginning refutes the misrepresentation of the policy of multiculturalism does not insist on a core of shared values relevant to all of us or that it promotes or is indifferent to separatism. In the case of multiculturalism, this is the limit of tolerance. Over the following decades, multicultural policy evolved down a succession of prime ministers. Bob Hawke initially vacillated and then acknowledged its importance. Paul Keating strongly supported multiculturalism in his prime ministership. The Howard government was at best ambivalent. John Howard came to the policy reluctantly. In 1991, he commented that Australia made an error in abandoning the former policy of encouraging assimilation and integration in favour of multiculturalism. John Howard had reservations about multiculturalism because he believed that it denigrated our national identity and undermined our, our social cohesion. In short, he believed that it tolerated too much. At the beginning of the Howard years, some of the public manifestations of multiculturalism were stripped away. For instance, the Office of Multicultural Affairs work in the Department of Prime Minister Cabinet and the Bureau of Immigration, Multicultural and Population Research were both abolished. But I think it's important to recollect that in 1999, John Howard signed off on a manifesto on multiculturalism. He released a new agenda for Multicultural Australia as a government policy in response to a report conducted by the National Multicultural Advisory Council. Multiculturalism briefly had the support of both the public and of the Prime Minister. I have to say public support uh, lived on a little while longer than the Prime Minister's. But there were, there were very powerful challenges generated by the terrorist attacks on Western targets, compounded, and I don't think the significance of this should be over underestimated, the extremist Islamist attacks in London, where the perpetrators were mostly born and bred in the United Kingdom. Strong concerns were voiced that multiculturalism permitted and facilitated the propagation of radical or fundamentalist Islamic ideals. Religion and Islam, in particular, replaced ethnicity as the key aspect of policy debate on multiculturalism. In the atmosphere of concerns about social cohesion, about what some people described as mad multiculturalism and Islamic extremism, the government early in 2006 introduced the idea of a new testing arrangement for citizenship. 
then Parliamentary Secretary for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, Andrew Romer, initially asserted that the new test was needed because he said, the twin challenges of global terrorism and the ageing population require us to become even more skilled at integrating an increasingly diverse population. The fact that the population became very diverse in the 70s and it switched from a preponderance of European migrants to Asian migrants in the beginning of the 80s did not seem to strike very much of a chord in this consideration of life. Uh, but the notion of a new test as, as a counter-terrorism measure was obvious, obviously unsustainable and was soon abandoned. Instead, the idea that the test would, pro would promote social cohesion more generally became the central justification. In November 2006, Mr. Robb linked his advocacy of the citizenship test to concerns about multiculturalism. He said that multiculturalism was vague and meant different things to different people. Some, he said, interpreted multiculturalism as a philosophy which rejected the idea of an overriding Australian culture and concluded that it is divisive. These comments foreshadow the demise of the term multiculturalism from the official language. A couple of months later, the Department of Immigration and Multicultural Affairs was renamed the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. In October 2007, a new citizenship test was imposed. I strongly opposed the test, and I've argued that its introduction signified a regression in our long-standing policy of inclusion, inclusive citizenship, that it would harm aspiring citizenship, citizens, that it would diminish it as a nation and seek to impose a template of national identity. My position was and is that governments should not try to impose a top-down model of national identity on the rest of us. The government's role should be about fostering a society that allows people the security, the freedom and the opportunity to define what they need to become an Australian. In opposition, Labor supported the legislation. In government, it, committed, it appointed a committee to review the test headed by a very distinguished diplomat, Richard Wilcock. It's unclear what the government's attitude towards the content of the test is, but Kevin Rudd did give an indication earlier this year when he said, its concept and direction is right, we just want to know uh, and make sure that all the details are right for the future. I think the Don is safe. And if the allusion to the Don doesn't get instant recognition, you've got further problems with the citizenship <laughs> test. The Citizenship test, test Review Committee reported to the government in August. Its report has not been published and the government has not indicated its likely response. There is once again a Parliamentary Secretary for Multicultural Affairs. And that's very really good. But if you look at the, de the Department of Immigration and Citizenship website, the page that the current policy says, this section of the website is currently being updated. And it said that since the government came into office. And it said that this morning. The, repro the, the, the fact is that the Rudd government's approach to multiculturalism is hugely opaque. So, where do we go? The reality of our diversity is as inescapable now as it has ever been. Racist violence does occur in Australia, but it is not indicative of the state of relations between Australians of different backgrounds. I believe that the events of 2005 and Cronulla were exceptional, the product of specific circumstances, time and place. But the Human Rights Commission and other bodies have documented religious and racial prejudice and discrimination, which adversely affects the, ad the individuals and, and groups who are targeted. And Arab and Muslim Australians have particularly been affected over the last decade. Ladies and gentlemen, religious and racial intolerance is a blight that we must address, as we have to address the other social problems 
that face our society, but we have to put its incidence into perspective. The evidence is that there is much interaction between people with different backgrounds in Australia and those, that those interactions are by and large harmonious. The overall integration of people from different nationalities into the wider Australian community is evidence of the success of a multicultural policy that was about choice, not about coercion. Migrants and their children have not been trapped in ghettos, cut off socially and economically from the mainstream. They have been influenced and they have in turn influenced the society at large. So, the question is, what governmental and broader political action is needed to regain the lost ground and to get back onto the path that was so productive? I believe that a number of things are necessary. The first is that we need a renewed political imprimatur. It is time for a reaffirmation by our political leaders of a commitment to non-discrimination in immigration and multiculturalism. I think the prime importance of this is symbolic, but there does need to be a, a commitment to pr promote a standard of accountability for the delivery of policies that ensure and provoke, promote the values of multiculturalism. I believe that we need to ensure that all back people of all backgrounds have effective and equitable access to key programs and services. Equality of opportunity was affirmed by Malcolm Fraser as a central tenet of Australian multiculturalism. The fact is that successive governments have committed to the principle and they've funded the sort of measures to assist migrants. But equality of opportunity is a principle we are far from achieved and its realisation is always going to need ongoing efforts. The Rudd government has an agenda for social inclusion and established the Social Inclusion Board. But the terms of reference for the board are extremely vague and they make no reference to multiculturalism or disadvantage experienced by migrants and refugees. I believe that the government should establish an independent st statutory body that addresses the issues of multiculturalism, migrants and refugees, and that has a strong mandate to rigorously research, monitor, report, and advise. I'm afraid that 30 years of experience with departments has persuaded me that the body should report directly to the Prime Minister. I think that we have to ensure that our media is responsive to our multicultural society. SDS, the Special Broadcasting Service, was established 30 years ago because the ABC and commercial services largely ignored the particular needs and interests of many Australians. The aims of SBS were not only to address the major gaps in provision for people, for people of non-English speaking background, but also to promote an understanding of cultural, linguistic and ethnic diversity in Australia. I think that SBS has done some terrific projects relating to Australians of all backgrounds, Indigenous and non-Indigenous and the manner in which we've made multiculturalism part of the character of our national broadcasting is, I think, a uniquely Australian achievement. But I am mindful that many of those who sh should be amongst SBS's staunchest supporters feel concerned about how its $100 million annual budget is spent. And I'm afraid that I share these reservations. I don't begrudge the pleasure many people get with shows like Top Gear and South Park. But where, for example, is the investment of programming to encourage and facilitate the learning of English? The purposes for which the service was established remain relevant to our evolving multicultural society. But I believe that we need an independent and comprehensive review of how successfully SBS is meeting its intended purposes. The independent review will need to report on how those purposes can be pursued most effectively in a dramatically new digital environment where entertainment information are pre presented over the internet, through MP3 players and DVDs, as well as TV and radio. Finally, 
we need to address our concerns about accommodating this diversity and draw on the lessons of how we dealt with this diversity in the past. One concern about religious diversity is the perceived conflict between obedience to the laws enacted by Parliament and the dictates of religion. A colleague, Senator Brett Mason, recently described a suggestion by some of Muslim faith that Australian law be amended to permit polygamy as, and I quote, the thin edge of the wedge in the creeping campaign to introduce Islamic jurisprudence into the Australian political system. Senator Mason warned, a nation with two legal systems reflecting so conflicting social and political philosophies is a house divided and it cannot stand. In his view, this was an instance of mushy multiculturalism which would weaken our traditional values to the point of collapse. Let me make it clear that the rule of law enacted by the Parliament has always been a non-negotiable central element of multiculturalism. Let me make it also clear that for the most part the laws or ethical systems of Islam and other faiths dictate behavioural standards that are quite uh, compatible within or alongside the framework of our civil law. As one commentator has observed, for some 300,000 Australian Muslims, Sharia represents little more than ethics, including honesty and enterprise, and liturgy, how to perform prayers, weddings and funerals. But even if Australian Muslims were to ask the Parliament to consider elements of their faith in framing our laws, I don't believe that this would present an unprecedented challenge to our law or to our society. On occasion, Australian legislators, legislatures have dealt with such situations by making provision for conduct in the law for conduct in accordance with religious dictates. A number of long-standing federal laws contain provisions which accommodate conscientiously held views whether these are specifically faith-based or secular. For instance, exemptions for liability for military service in time of war, exemption, exemptions for compliance with sex discrimination. The law does not impose on religion female priests, rabbis or any imams. I emphasise on occasion because Victoria and other jurisdictions long ago legislated, for instance, that parents who believe that blood transfusions infringe their faith do not have the right to deny their treat this treatment to their children in life-threatening circumstances. The Victorian Parliament is currently considering a law requiring doctors who have a conscientious objection to abortion to refer women to other providers. There have been strong protests to this and strong opposition to this from people not least of Catholic faith. The second area of contestation is with regard to faith-based schools. Some commentators have argued that they represent a threat to secular liberal democracy and promote separatism. Now, we're not going to the radical fringes here. Former agent of Michael Gawenda has recently suggested that it was ironic that John Howard was determined to roll back multiculturalism, but was inadvertently its, bigger, his, its biggest champion through the government's strong financial support of faith-based schools. It's not always clear whether those concerned about this policy are suggesting that faith-based schools should not receive public funding or whether they should be prohibited. But either measure is highly problematic. We've gone down the path of no state aid to non-government schools. This is not hypothesising. It resulted in a three-tier education, one, an independent and wealthy uh, sector, some of which was strongly faith-based, the secular state system, and poor faith-based and mostly Catholic schools. It was a highly inequitable system. Reverting to that policy strikes me as being a, a recipe for greater division. In Australia, 
all types of schools, government, private, faith-based and secular, are required to comply with certain rules. In Victoria, for instance, schools must support and promote the principles and practice of Australian democracy, including the commitment to elected government, the rule of law, equal rights of all, freedom of religion, speech, association, and the values of tolerance and openness. I think that the policy is right. I think we need to focus our efforts on ensuring that all schools, public, faith-based and independent, effectively support these principles and practice. Jesuit priest and author Father Frank Brennan has rightly observed that citizens are at liberty to agitate for law and policy inspired by their religious faith. But the public officials should, and I quote, reject those claims which, if implemented, would result in an interference of the basic rights and liberties of citizens who do not share their religious viewpoint. They should also reject those claims if their implementation would run counter to the contemporary social values of equality, tolerance, compassion and dignity for all people at all stages of the life cycle. I think he's right. In a democracy, people do have the right to advocate their views, what public policy should be, whether their views about the right course of action are based on re religious or secular ethical foundations. It is the politician's job to consider and assess these views on their merits and consider what the impact of them will be on the community. Ladies and gentlemen, almost 30 years ago, almost as long as this speech seems to have been going on, when I was director of the Australian Institute of Multicultural Affairs, people asked them, they really did ask me whether I had a vision of what Australia, multicultural Australia would look like in 2000. I said that I hope it would be a society within which a framework of key shared values, people had the opportunity to choose what they wanted to be. If they wanted to maintain elements of the culture of their origin that did not violate, violate Australian laws, they could do so. If they wanted to speak and read the language of their origin as well as learn English, they should be able to do so. If they wanted to adopt everything iconically Australian and forget about everything else, they should be able to do so. This is the ultimate logic of multiculturalism. For government, my key premise was that confecting or enforcing a specific national identity was beyond and is beyond the state's proper views and competence. The role of the state was to foster the development of an environment in which people have a reasonable opportunity to define who they are and who they wish to be. With regard to the community, the foundation of multiculturalism was based on a confidence that the capacity of the Australian society to accommodate diversity was far greater than many believed, not least some of their political leaders. The fears that the nation would divide have not come to fruition, and this is a testament of our ability to embrace diversity. We have regressed over the last decade, but not because the vision was flawed or outdated. Our society has changed greatly in the decades succeeding the initial implementation of multicultural policies and non-discriminatory immigration policies, but the principle mapped out in them endure. I believe that the message of those who walk the corridors of Howard Canberra need to, be loud, need to be reminded of loudly and persistently, and I hope you join me in doing that. Thank you.